Well, this evening, I've already told you, I think, through my prayers and beforehand what it is we're doing. Uh, let me begin by reading, um, as I mentioned, one of the books that we're reading as we're reading the Bible together, uh, the letter of Jude. Uh, there are 25 verses in this particular letter, just one chapter, as you know. Uh, but we're going to look particularly at what is really a summary of what it is Jude is writing this for, uh, which is that those who are in the church that he's writing to would understand uh, that these things that they're struggling with, the people who have infiltrated them, this is a very serious issue, and they need to continue to hold fast to the truth, uh, not the least of which is that the Lord calls us to live a godly life. Let me go ahead and read this um, these 25 verses. Jude, by the inspiration of the Spirit, writes this, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, um, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed it with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals by these things they are destroyed woe to them for they have gone the way of Cain and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah these are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear caring for themselves Clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all. And to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers, following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Well, that was your, that was your first sermon. <laughs> 
And really, you can't have a better sermon than that which is purely uh, the Word of God. But what I would like us to focus on this evening is what Jude tells us in verses 3 and 4 with regard to contending for the faith. Uh, and again, the, the two main things that he points to here, uh, which I think were, were quite clear, the first one particularly, uh, the ungodliness. Uh, that is a corrupting influence in the church, sin. Uh, those who turn the grace of God into a license for sin, uh, that's the first error that we are to avoid. Uh, the second one is, uh, in doing so, it is basically denying our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And as we see in these letters written in the New Testament, he is denied in a variety of ways, and certainly that continues to be the case today. So what we want to do is focus on more generally how we are to contend for the truth of the gospel that the Lord has given to us, even as we are to offer an apologetic or a defense of the faith to those outside the church, we are to, um, well, contend for the truth of the gospel within the church. It's important for our well-being. We don't want to be deceived. It's important, of course, for the well-being of anyone who may be deceived into giving up those things that are foundational. So that's what we're looking at. Now, as I mentioned last week, we did consider what Peter uh, wrote to his audience in 1 Peter 3.15, that we are called at all times to be ready to be ready to give a reason, uh, a defense, what we call an apologetic, for the, for the hope that is in us, the hope of the forgiveness of our sins, the hope of deliverance from judgment, the hope of eternal life, which is what we were looking at this morning, of course, uh, as we considered the resurrection, that we are to do this with gentleness and with reverence. In other words, uh, we're not to do it with a vindictive spirit, we're not to do it with a hateful spirit, you know, as it were, a holier-than-thou kind of attitude, but rather with a heart that is full of compassion toward the lost. And a fear, the fear of the Lord, that would move us to speak the truth to them, knowing what will happen to them if they don't turn from their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus. Now, last week... We also looked at different ways which we can do this, that we can defend the faith. And it, it goes from very simple to perhaps uh, more complicated. Uh, of course, um, we really need to trust the Lord for the wisdom on how to approach people. Jesus, when he called his disciples, said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He was talking about the same kind of thing, preaching the gospel, defending the faith, uh, evangelizing the lost. And as we know, each particular kind of individual needs a particular approach. As Paul says, he becomes all things to all men. But we can do something as simple as sharing our testimony, you know, how the Lord's mercy changed our lives, what I was like before Christ, what, what I'm like now by his mercy and his grace. And of course, for the people who knew what we were like before we came to Jesus, that can be a very powerful uh, defense, a very powerful evidence of the truth of the gospel. Of course, we can give them other kinds of evidence, as we saw. We can show them the many ways that the Bible shows itself to be the Word of God. And we looked at those last week. I think perhaps the most powerful that we also looked at this morning is fulfilled prophecy, where the Lord tells us many centuries before it happens exactly what it is He's intending on doing. Uh, we can use, as we saw, the classical arguments for God's existence and for the truth that, the, well, that the Bible is His Word uh, by taking the evidence that God shows all men in the creation and then drawing from that uh, what it is that God actually wants us to see and says that we do see in the creation, and that is that He exists and we see something of what He is like. And, of course, as we look in the Bible and we see that the Bible uh, really reveals to us exactly the God that we see in the creation, we know that this is His Word. And we can use what is called the presuppositional argument. We can show them uh, from their own assumptions, using their own principles of how they interpret reality. We can show them the inconsistency of their views, the, uh, how they basically refute themselves. And after we've shown them the absurdity of their particular view, whatever it may be, we can invite them into our worldview and try to show them things through the eyes of Scripture 
to show them that these things really make sense only in a biblical framework. And as I mentioned before, we can bring in the evidence, we can bring in the classical arguments, we can use everything uh, using this particular method. But again, the Lord wants us to be ready to defend the faith to those who are outside the church, to tell them why it is we believe what we believe, why we have hope, a hope that they do not have. But I want us to see this evening that he also wants us to be able to defend the faith within the church. It's, it's sad that we would have to do such a thing, but Jude told us even in those days that there were those in the church that did not truly believe, and I think we find that in just about every one of these letters, these warnings about those who come into the church with their views that destroy the gospel in one way or another, either those foundational truths of the gospel or, well, I should say it's as a part of that foundational truth that we should live holy and godly lives. Now, that's what Jude is writing to us in verse 3. He says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Now, we do need to realize that what he was experiencing in, in his day is not, is not gone today. The problem still exists with us, and so the call is, is still placed upon us. Jude here, by the, by the Holy Spirit, is urging us to contend earnestly to, to struggle, to make a strenuous effort on behalf of the faith, which is a summary for the gospel, what it is that we are to believe, the message that God uses to save, which he says was once for all, that is once for all time, handed down to the saints. By the way, in saying this, he also is telling us there is no other message the Lord uses to save. This is the faith. This is the gospel. This is the only way of salvation. So we need to keep it intact and we need to keep it, keep it pure. Now, why does he make this appeal? Well, he gives us a summary in verse 4. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what he's telling us is that some had become a part of this congregation whose unbelief and ungodliness apparently escaped the notice of their leaders who had oversight of those who were actually brought into the number of the believers and joined themselves with that particular congregation. And these men were distorting the truth. In this case, Jude tells us they were using the Lord's mercy and His grace as an excuse for their sin, as a license to sin, licentiousness, a problem that we still have to face today. As a matter of fact, um, sadly, I, I may have, I've mentioned this, I'm sure, before, the college I went to was defending the position that you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be perhaps the most adamant enemy of the church and use all of your powers to destroy her, but you're still going to heaven because you at one point believed the facts, as it were, and um, uh, perhaps prayed uh, the prayer. Turning the Lord's mercy and grace into a license for sin. Hey, if I'm going to, to heaven anyway, it doesn't really matter how I live, so I can live it up and still make it to heaven. Judas telling us that isn't why God gives us His grace and mercy. It's not so we can sin, but it's so that we might be free from sin, that we might be holy. But they were also denying the only Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. And we don't know exactly what they were denying. Perhaps by their living an ungodly life, they were denying Him and His person because His example is that of holiness. They could be denying His deity. Certainly we have examples of that today. His humanity. Uh, we see that in the letters of John. The, the pre-Gnostic ideas, the idea that ma the material universe is evil, that the Messiah could not be an actual human being. John says that if you believe that, then you really cannot be a Christian. They may have been denying his Messiahship, which the Jews did, denying that he is in fact the Son of God and the Christ that was sent into the world. Or maybe the fact that he alone is the Savior 
as many today want to believe, thinking that uh, any religion can really lead us to God, that God's at the center of the hub and the religions are all just many spokes leading to the same conclusion, or something else about him that is vital or foundational to the gospel. As we look back over the history of the church, these two things are perhaps most often attacked by the, any, uh, the enemy, that we must be holy, the idea that Jesus not only delivers us from the guilt of our sins, but also from the power of our sins, and what the Bible says about Jesus, that he is God and man, that he is the only way to God, and he is all that we need in order to to be saved. Now, knowing that the gospel is under attack today by our enemy, as we saw, I think, a few weeks ago, who never tires of lying, we do need to understand what he's attacking. He's attacking the foundational truths of the gospel, and we need to purpose to ground ourselves in these truths, not only for our own safety, but for the safety of our brothers and sisters in the Lord, in case we should see them beginning to stray from these truths. And also that we might be able to reclaim uh, others from those lies that will ultimately destroy them. Now, as we, of course, go through this and as we, we sort of look at examples of people today who are believing things that, that strike at the very heart of the gospel, that, that destroy the gospel, that uh, make them either, you know, well, basically unbelievers, a cult, and so forth, I, I, I want to make sure because in the past... <laughs> well, there, there was one instance where there was a gentleman in the church, and whenever I said anything negative about a cult, a false religion, he would get upset about it, and he eventually left because he didn't want to hear me say anything bad about anyone. We need to understand that we bring these up as examples so that we can understand what they believe, that what they believe is dangerous, is soul-destroying, so that we might be able to reach out to them with the truth and bring them into the truth and into the true church through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not meant to be hate speech. It's meant to be a loving thing. So tonight we're going to begin to, um, well, basically to consider those fundamental principles of the Christian faith, the things that we must believe in order to be saved. Now this, as I've said, these are the things that tie us all together as Christians. These are the things that, the principles that go across denominational barriers and really bring us or group us all together as believers in a common Lord. We all share the same faith. And what that means is this, that when it comes to biblical truth, we need to remember that not every truth in the Bible is equal. Now, they're all important, but there are some that are far more important than others. Uh, for instance, when, when Jesus is coming again is not as important as the fact that he is coming again. Now, all believers believe that he's coming again, but we may differ on exactly when that is. Well, again, there's differing levels of importance of these truths. Uh, Another example might be uh, in differing denominations, we'll find different modes of baptism, you know. The idea of, you know, sprinkling, pouring, immersion, or perhaps multiple immersions or whatever it may be. The mode that we use isn't nearly as important as the fact that we are baptized, that we be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the triune God. That's important. Uh, there are many things, many other things, I suppose, over which genuine believers disagree, but all disagreements do not carry the same weight. Now, here's one way of explaining this that I think uh, can be helpful, at least I found to be helpful. Uh, there are truths that are primary, truths that are fundamental, that are foundational, that are essential to the Christian faith. Those are the ones we're going to be uh, looking at over the next couple of weeks, there are truths that are secondary. We might say second level truths. Things that we can differ on but still be Christians, but which di may divide us into different denominations. And there are third level truths that believers can disagree on within their own denominations. 
okay? And, and even amongst ourselves in, in differing denominations. Now, examples of, of this third, these third-level truths would be, again, maybe the mode of baptism, okay? How we baptize. Should we sprinkle? Should we pour? Should we immerse in water, okay? Well, our confession, thankfully, says that we may do any of those three, and uh, that's not a problem for us. But again, that shouldn't be... That's something that may be debated within this particular denomination. How often we should observe the Lord's Supper? I mean, how often does your denomination or other denominations observe it? Annually, some do it once a year. Some do it quarterly, every three months. Some do it monthly. I think perhaps most churches do it monthly. Some do it weekly. Uh, we actually do it weekly. But, but again, that's sort of an interdenominational debate and it's not one of, you know, it's not really, really important, but it's important. I don't want to say it's not important. It is important. Uh, what should we use for the elements in the Lord's Supper? Uh, that's another area of disagreement. Leavened bread, unleavened bread, uh, grape juice, wine. What about God's kingdom? How, how much is it going to progress before Jesus returns? Okay. Will it, will it be a neck-and-neck neck race all the way to the end with Satan's kingdom until the Lord Jesus comes? Or will it overcome Satan's kingdom and fill the whole world before Jesus comes? So those are, we'd say, third-level truths, disputes within perhaps a denomination. Uh, examples of second-level truths would be maybe how the church should be governed. Some churches govern by vote of the people. It's, it's a democracy. Uh, some governed by a board of deacons. Uh, some, and I think all would, would, would certainly admit to this, they all want to be governed by the Lord Jesus. And there are those churches that do govern through the word of the Lord, uh, ministered by his elders. And we would call that uh, elder rule. And that would divide denominations. Uh, how the Old and New Covenants are related to one another, whether God has a separate and special plan for national Israel, whether there's going to be a future revival for Israel and maybe a separate plan and a millennium in which he's going to uh, give Israel their millennial kingdom, or whether the future for Israel is the same as it is for the church since the church is enjoying the blessings that God has actually promised to Israel. Uh, that can divide denominations. How the Lord saves sinners divides denominations. Does he do part of the work, sending his son into the world to die for everyone, and unbelievers all have the ability to uh, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and to receive him unto eternal life? Or does the Lord do all the work? because we're dead in our sins and unable really to do anything to receive the Lord Jesus or even prepare ourselves to receive him. Now again, these are second level truths that divide denominations. And again, let me just say, just because these things might be second level or third level truths does not mean that they are unimportant. They are all important. Every truth is necessary for what we call the well-being of the church. I think we, every denomination would agree with that and that every place we deviate from what the Bible says is going to hurt us in some way. But there are those things that are fundamental, foundational, what we call primary, first-level truths that are more important because they are necessary not just for the well-being, our well-being, the well-being of the church, but for the being of the church. Because without these things, we cannot be saved. This is what divides the true church from a false church, from, the, you know, from, from a cult. Why it is the cultists cannot be saved? Because they're believing in a false God, believing in a false Christ, trying to approach him in a false way. So those are the things that we want to look at. What are those things that are foundational that actually tie all the denominations together into one church, one body of Christ? What are those truths? Well, they can be divided into five categories. And I'd like just to survey them this evening because what I'd like to do is, is um, over the next couple of weeks, go through them and hopefully ground us a little bit more, refresh our minds in these truths so that we'll be better able to 
defend these things and contend for these things. Uh, it is interesting. Um, growing up, I, I had some close friends that, um, that were all, you know, were raised in a church and, and we believed the truths. And then as you kind of become adults and you're going on for a little bit, even in the 20s, you begin to hear some, some things like, I'm not sure that I believe that Jesus is God. You know, well, wait a minute, that's, that's problematic because that's who Jesus is and you have to believe that in order to be saved. But there's, there's a lot of believers that, that are still fuzzy about these things and, and don't, aren't really settled. And we want to make sure that we understand what the Bible says. Hopefully we're all fully grounded in these things already, but uh, I just want to do this as a refresher. So the first truth is this, and again, this is just going to be hopefully a, a brief overview. The first is that the Bible is the inspired, which means it's directed, governed, superintended by the Holy Spirit in its writing. It is inerrant. It contains no errors. It is infallible. Nothing that it says can possibly fail to be true. Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. And because it is, it is the rule, the standard of what it is we are to believe about God and what, how we are to live for His glory. Now, because that is essential to everything else we're going to believe because our faith comes out of this book. The devil is certainly going to do everything he can to try to discredit this book, and that's exactly what he does. Now, here's a few examples. You've, you perhaps uh, have heard of deism. Okay, deism is the belief that God created the world. He wound up the clock, as it were. He, he basically designed it, uh, put it into motion, and then he withdraws in order to watch from a distance, and he doesn't communicate, and he doesn't interact. He just simply watches. Well, that's one way the devil denies, tries to lead people to deny the fact that the Bible is the Word of God because he's withdrawn from his creation. He's not involved in his creation. He doesn't really care what you do, so he's not going to communicate what he wants you to know. He expects you to find out everything you need to know about him from natural revelation. Liberalism is an attack against the supernatural and tries to explain the Bible purely as, as the writings of men, as essentially legends that have developed within the church, things that the church wishes are true, that decided to believe because it's good to believe them, but in reality really aren't true. So again, liberalism denies supernaturalism, denies God, denies the Bible is his word, another lie of the enemy. Uh, what's called neo-orthodoxy, which was the, the new orthodoxy, the reaction to this liberal idea, which sort of tries to find middle ground between fundamentalism, which is where we are, and liberalism. And that's the idea that the Bible is not the word of God, but it only contains the word of God, and then when you ask the question, well, if it contains the Word of God, which part of it is the Word of God and which part isn't, they would say, well, none of it is until it actually speaks to you. Then it becomes the Word of God to you. Well, again, that's a denial that the Bible is the Word of God because, you know, anything could speak to you at any time. And if the whole thing doesn't or if it speaks to you at one time and it doesn't speak to you at another, it can become the Word of God and then not be the Word of God. It can't be the standard. So another denial Many professing Christians, even though they may say they believe the Bible is the Word of God, don't respect the Bible as they should. Many don't believe that it's without error. They don't believe it's infallible. Many professing Christians live as though it isn't the Word of God. They don't read it. They don't believe it. They don't do what it says. And yet they go to church and they profess to be Christians. I believe if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we love Him, we're going to want to know what it is he wants us to do, how he wants us to live, and we're going to read the Bible, and we're going to, by his grace, do the very best we can to love him and serve him in this way. Well, again, the point here is if we are to be saved and if we are to contend for the truth, we need to believe the Bible is the Word of God. We need to read the Bible. We need to believe the Bible. We need to do what the Bible says. We need to defend the Bible 
against the attacks of the enemy. That's what it means to contend for the faith. And we're going to see something how to do that in future weeks. Well, the second foundational belief is the doctrine of the Trinity, that there is only one God who exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, the devil also attacks this teaching, not surprisingly. He does it through different forms of Unitarianism, which is the belief that there is one God, but there's only one person in this one God. Jehovah's Witnesses are an example of this. They believe in, in one God, but they believe the Father is that God, not the Son and not the Spirit. They say the Son is a God. They say he's created God. He's like God, but he's not God. They think the Spirit is just an impersonal force that he sends out to do his will. They're Unitarians. The Apostolic and United Pentecostal churches also are Unitarian. They believe that there's one God, but unlike Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe that Jesus is the person of that one God, that the Father is his divine nature, the Son is his human nature, and the Spirit is just another word for his divine nature. So there's one person, one God. So he attacks it through Unitarianism. The Bible clearly tells us that isn't the case, and we're going to see that as we again go along. But the devil also attacks the Trinity through polytheism, the belief in many gods. You know, Mormons hold to polytheism. They believe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, but they are three separate gods. So you have th at least three. But they further believe that the Father was created, that he was once a man like we are, that he was created by another God, and that he worked his way into Godhood through his good works. And they believe that that process of being created by a God and working their way to Godhood, who creates another world, and those work their way to Godhood, at least some of them, has been going on for endless ages. There's no beginning to it. It's an infinite regress, as it were, all the way back. And that means that essentially they believe in an almost limitless number of gods. So Unitarianism, uh, polytheism, these are different ways the devil attacks the Trinity. And of course, he attacks the Trinity through atheism, the belief that there is no God. And again, that's what liberals, among others, believe. Now, if we are to be saved, we, and if we are to contend for the faith, we must believe that there is one God, that he exists eternally in three persons, and that he is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. That is the true God. We must believe in the true God if we are to be saved. As a matter of fact, Athanasius and the Athanasian Creed had some pretty choice things to say about the necessity of believing in the Trinity. I would recommend your reading of that. The third foundational belief is that Jesus is the second person of the triune God who became a man for us and for our salvation, was born of the Virgin, lived a perfect life, died an atoning death, was raised again to life on the third day, ascended to heaven, is ruling and reigning now and will return to raise the dead and gather the living to the final judgment on the last day. We need to believe in the right Jesus and in the things that he has done to save us. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses deny this. They believe Jesus is an angel that the Father made into a man. Uh, they believe he is a God, but he is not the God. Mormons deny this. They believe that Jesus... And it's, it's blasphemous to think about what, the, what they actually believe, both Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, but they believe Jesus is, first of all, the spirit child of Elohim, who is the father, and one of his celestial wives, of which he has many, and that Mary was not a virgin when she conceived and gave birth to Jesus, but rather is the result of his having relations, the father, with the virgin Mary. Now, if we are to be saved, and if we are to contend for the faith, we have to believe in the true Jesus, who is both God and man, born of the Virgin, who did the things that the Bible says he actually did. Now, the fourth foundational truth is that man, who was originally made in the image of God, fell away from him and was born into this world under condemnation 
and in danger of hell and in need of redemption. If we don't believe that, then we're never going to come to Jesus for salvation. Now, the devil works to attempt to remove the danger by denying the existence of hell. Uh, John Gerson, I was listening to some tapes by his on Jonathan Edwards, very enjoyable, but he uh, points out that every cult has this in common. They all deny hell. Jehovah's Witnesses believe in annihilation. So do the Mormons. And again, every deviation from, uh, well, from the foundations of, of the truth, every, every cult believes this. Now, if we are to be saved, and if we are to contend for the faith, we must believe there is something that we need to be saved from, which is the just condemnation of our sins, which would have put us in hell, in the lake of fire for all eternity. We need to believe there's a danger that we need to be saved from. And then the final foundational truth is this, that we can be saved only by the grace of our God received through faith alone, that we must trust in Jesus alone, in his atoning death to take away our sins, in his righteousness to make us right in God's eyes. And we must also believe that the faith by which we are justified, that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that justification does not come alone, but is always accompanied by sanctification, the very thing that Jude is saying that these men were denying. If we are true believers, we will love as Jesus loves. But we won't be as perfect as he is until we arrive in heaven. Now, you know that Jehovah's Witnesses deny justification by grace through faith alone. I was telling somebody this morning that um, on one occasion, Jehovah's Witness came to the door. She told me she had good news to share with me. I said, well, you know, what is that good news? I, I just kind of played dumb. I just, but you just tell me what you, what you believe. What, what is the good news? Well, man can live forever in paradise on earth. Okay, well, that's good. What do I have to do? Well, first of all, you have to join the Watchtower Society. You need to study the Bible with us. And then you need to go door to door with us and proselytize others and tell them the good news. And I said, oh, and if I do that, will, will I be able to participate in this paradise on earth? And, and she said, yes. I said, there's nothing more I need to do. And she said, no. And I said, well, let me tell you what the Bible says about salvation, about the gospel. And I pointed out, you know, that Jesus died according to the scriptures. He was buried raised again the third day. We are saved by grace through faith alone. And then Paul says, if anyone comes to you with another gospel than the one that I have given to you, he is accursed. And I said, do you realize you didn't talk anything about Jesus or trusting in Jesus? All you told me was works, works, works. Just join us and work. I said, do you realize the Bible says you're accursed? Now, hopefully I didn't do that in a mean spirit, but that was what the Bible says about that kind of belief. They deny salvation by grace through faith alone. They believe salvation comes through works alone. And Mormons also deny that salvation is by grace through faith alone. They believe in salvation through baptism. They believe being baptized in the Mormon church and that you can even save your departed loved ones by, first of all, finding out who they are and then by being baptized in proxy for them. You can save your relatives all the way back to the beginning of the world if you know who they are. You know, many professing Christians today believe that they need to keep up a certain level of works in order to maintain their salvation. They believe that they're saved by grace through faith, but they have to keep their salvation by walking a tight line. Now, we do believe that if you are saved, you will obey the Lord and you'll serve Him and you'll love Him and so forth but you're not saved by your works, and you don't keep yourself saved by your works. And, of course, sadly, as I mentioned before, the college that I went to believed that the new birth which God gives through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or actually gives us through the new birth the ability to believe, they believe that that does not change our nature at all, but that we can still be the worst of sinners and still go to heaven because we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the fact is the Bible says if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your life is going to be changed. It's going to be transformed. So if we are to be saved and contend for the faith, 
We must believe that we are saved by Jesus alone, both from our guilt and the power of sin. He frees us from our bondage to sin, gives us a new heart, gives us the Holy Spirit, and a love for what is good. That is life transforming because it, it takes place in the very center of our lives. Now, in closing, let me just say this. Now, these, these are the things we must believe to be saved. These are the things that we are called by the Lord to contend with but, or contend for. But let's not forget what the Bible also says, and that is that we can believe all the right things and still not be believers, okay? This isn't a matter just of believing facts. Believing these facts, we need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? James tells us the devils know all these things are true. The devils believe and they tremble, but they're not saved. The difference is, of course, a saving faith produces works, James says. Faith without works is dead. The works of love, the evidences of a changed life. When we see these, we know that we belong to him. So let's not just have a right belief. Let's make sure that knowing what it is we are to believe, that we entrust ourselves to the Savior, that we receive him and his righteousness and his, his atoning death, his forgiveness, to wash us of our sins and to clothe our nakedness and to make us acceptable to the Father. And let's look for the evidence of that changed heart that the Bible tells us we will have that will move us to begin to do the things that our Lord Jesus, in fact, did in his life. Now, next week, as I've said, we're going to be, begin looking more closely at each of these foundational teachings, but hopefully this has been a good review of what it is that is essential and what ties all believers together into one body, uh, the body of Christ. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and ask the Lord to um, take and apply what we've heard is as he wills.